We are back! The Friendly Neighborhood Fanboys right here with MiddleOfNowhereGaming.com. It's been a while, but we're still here. We had to do that whole holiday break thing. The winter gets oh. sporadic. I'm your host, Chaz King. With me, as always, Adam Leonard. Whoop, whoop. Welcome to the Dark Carnival, folks. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that's a, That's weird. <laughs> A lot's happened uh, for the break. <laughs> Adam Leonard has become a juggalo. <laughs> uh, luckily not, but I, if I had, I might have had to kill myself. So, <laughs> Or did you just watch the episode of Workaholics that is scarily accurate? Um, I haven't – I've definitely seen it multiple times. I haven't seen it recently. <laughs> um, definitely did see some jig- j- jigglos. Well, uh, uh, juggalo. <laughs> Definitely did see some juggalos around Eugene recently. That was a pretty special event. Nice. Did they have like a concert or something? Um, no. And I checked, and I was like, I thought, like, I thought, well, probably they're not going to come to Eugene, Oregon. But I'm like, maybe like Twisted or one other other like little like inbred offsprings <laughs> were like wandered out this way because I'm sure the Wow Hall could probably fit one of those. But yeah, yeah, the Wow Hall is a very special place. I almost went and saw Esham. Like, yeah, I don't know who Isham is. <laughs> He's um, one of the Insane Clown Posse's quote-unquote influences uh, from Detroit. Ooh. Yeah, he's crazy. I thought basically the Insane Clown Posse's influences were that Faces of Death video. That too. They've, they've <laughs> got a, a weird, rich, wonderful history. <laughs> not not Juggalos, but I was at the mall yesterday, and I did see like a pretty spectacular sight. I saw these like two like tween or teenish girls wandering around the mall, and one of them was dressed up like Sally from Nightmare Before Christmas, sadly without the face makeup, and then the other girl had a mohawk and was in like a skeleton onesie. Nice. That sounds sounds in place. That was a gateway, yeah. Uh, no, it was actually Valley River. Oh wow. Oh wow. I was expecting a gateway, but then again, I guess. Uh, yeah, it's been a while since I've been there. Regional. <laughs> So okay, so probably for our listeners who none of which live in Eugene, Oregon, well, actually, probably probably our listeners who live in Eugene, Oregon, they're the only ones that are listening to this. To be fair, um, other than our good friend Chris Cobb. Yay, Chris. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we have like two malls in Eugene slash Springfield. We're kind of like a dual town, and we've got like Valley River Center is like the nice mall, and like Gateway. Center is basically like if like if you've ever gone if you ever seen the movie uh, Mall Rats, a uh, Gateway Mall is like the dirt mall. <laughs> yeah, where they go get their like, their fortune told. It's like like the, it's like the sketchy. It's actually different now. Like you haven't been here in a while because Gateway Mall's been completely like busted up and like renovated and stuff. And now it still has like an indoor door portion, but now it's kind of like a strip mall. Weird. Um, and, you know, it's got, like, a bunch of, like, you know, clothing shops, and it's got, like, a Hobby Lobby now. It's got, like, a Panera Bread and like, the, uh, in the, um, in, like, just a kind of the general vicinity. So they're trying to, they're trying to class it up. It's called now, it's now called the Shops at Gateway. Shops being, of course, spelled, like, S-H-O-P-P-S. Wow. Uh... <laughs> I miss I miss the mall that had the weird amusement park rides in it, mm-hmm. and that guy who was like saw my Joker shirt and said, "Hey, is that the Joker? <laughs> Joker's the best." Well, the good thing, like, and you'll the good thing is like the classy malls now kind of taken on some of Gateway's like eccentricities. Um, a lot of the shops from Gateway, when like Gateway basically busted itself up, moved over to. Um, moved over to Valley River Center. Um, like Spencer's is there now. Wow. And by the way, like, can I mention like Spencer's is kind of really classily evolved because like Spencer's was like originally like a dispensary of like trashy T-shirts and kind of like, kind of just like suggestive like ooh 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 like sexy items. Spencer's now has like literally like butt plugs and dildos in plain view in the back of the shop now. <laughs> it's like you go in, there's like there's their T-shirts, there's their hats. And then there's, like, a row of butt plugs and dildos. <laughs> well, Adam, when in doubt, just hate her in the shitter. 
Um, and, like, and I'm sure they've probably tried to spencerize it. It's probably not called like a dildo or a vibrator. It's probably called like a giggle stick or something like that. It's meant for fun parties, but I mean, it's a dildo that goes into a hole somewhere. Oh, wow. uh, also, taking on like the amusement park aspect, they also have this weird thing. Like, it's kind of still incomprehensible to me, as they have these things like. Um, imagine, like, if they took, like, okay, you know what a rascal scooter is? Like, you know, like, the thing that really fat people have to, like, drive around, like, the store or, like, the mall or something like that? Yeah. Imagine they take one of those, and then instead of a scooter, they turn it into, like, a stuffed animal, so it looks like it's, like, a panda bear. Okay. And then they let parents pay for their kids to ride them around the mall. <laughs> and they're, like, faster than a rascal scooter. They, like, they clip at a pretty good pace. And so, like, you'll be wandering around the mall, and here are these little kids driving motorized pandas, free form, mind you. Like, not, like, it's not on a track or anything like that. They're just, like, kind of scooting along in these, like, little, like, panda go-karts around the mall. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that's, that's, uh, that's what's become of our classy mall. <laughs> so when, I, when I was there yesterday, there was, like, a tween that was clearly too old to be using it. Just like riding around on it for like an hour. Oh no! Well, I guess I guess if you pay for it, you can ride around on a panda scooter. I suppose so. Like it just seems like a bad idea. It seems like somebody's gonna get run over. Like some toddler's gonna get killed by like a panda scooter, and then it's gonna be real sad. GTA VRC stories. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, that's that's Adam's segment of what's going on with like the Eugene, Oregon malls. So, <laughs> I'm sure you were, everybody was wondering. So now that's updated. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh man and shout outs to uh, All Comedy 1450 there in that area once again just gotta mm-hmm. shout them out Middle of Nowhere Gaming letting us do this thing man uh, it's been a while been up to a lot of stuff um, mm-hmm. Star Wars happened but that was covered on another podcast we could touch on it a little bit if we'd like oh I think we need to okay. because we have to have our discussion about it <laughs> Yes, yes, we have not. We have not had our discussion. Um, let's see. I guess my initial thought is uh, this is a great volley first serve. Um, mm-hmm. Where is it going to go next? I want to know. And it's only a year and a half away. That's like now almost. Yes. Um, yeah, like I said, it, like my opinion hasn't really fluctuated much. Um, it's because, like, you know, basically – I can't buy anybody telling me it was, like, the film of the year, and there were some people who will try to give me real viable reasons why. Um, like I said, it's exactly what you said it was. It was a great first attempt at bringing back the Star Wars film, or the Star Wars franchise. It was, I mean, you know, like I said, maybe, if it maybe clung to the original plot lines of, you know, New Hope a little too closely, but understandably because it was trying to make sure it got got it right. Um, and so I'm okay with them being a little bit safe just to kind of prove that they can do it. Mm-hmm. So I am completely excited to see where they go from here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think I said to you in an off-air conversation, uh, it's my emotional favorite of the year, just because I got all like, wee, giddy, Star Wars, yay! Um, but critically, uh, I still have to go with Mad Max and probably Creed right behind that. Uh, and you know, the interesting thing is I get that, you know, I get that people... Uh, I get that people, you know, that people were emotionally attached to Star Wars. For me, like, even emotionally, Mad Max still is, and that's, it's still why it's sitting at the top of my list, because there was just something, there was just, like, something really awe-inspiring about Mad Max. It was just, like, this, like, kind of wonderful sensory overload, and um, there was particularly a moment where I was basically turned into a kid again, where, like, the part where, like, dude gets blind by, like, the bullet town guy gets blinded by, uh, kind of that explosion, so then all of a sudden he's, like, claiming that he's, he is justice, and he's all blind, he's got the two Uzis shooting up in the air. I was, like, giggling like a, fi- you know, like, I was giggling like an eight-year-old, because it was just so, like, absurd and wonderful, and I couldn't believe I was watching this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's pretty. It's a pretty fantastic movie. I'll admit, uh, I've seen Star Wars three times, mm-hmm. and uh, it is one of those movies that I feel gets better every time you watch it. Uh, just like Mad Max. Mad Max has that too. I feel it gets better yep. every mm-hmm. time you watch it. You always notice something new, something different. Uh, my biggest, my favorite thing actually to come out of Star Wars is a lot of the fan theories. 
Mm-hmm. I really like a lot of the fan theories. Um, most importantly, I don't know. Have you read this one? I'm sure you have. It's everywhere. That Ray is a Kenobi. Yes. I love that idea, and I will probably cry if it is real. I will freak out and just be like, woohoo, yes! Uh, I, I, I'm definitely not opposed. I want to see like how you'd craft it together. Um, I've also heard that you know maybe the two prevalent theories are going to come together somehow, somehow, some way. A Skywalker and a Kenobi wound up having a kid somehow. Mm. Um, I know that recently the director of the next film, Rian Johnson. Um, has just gone on to state that, quote-unquote, Ray's, the answer to Ray's, like, backstory is going to be incredibly satisfying. Cool, 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 cool. And it's in good hands. Like, Rian Johnson um, is, you know, directing the next one. He's uh, most noted for directing Looper. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, are, are we predicting an Empire Strikes Back vibe? Because Looper's pretty dark. He he claimed – he said that uh, – you know, what I've read is that it's going to be a darker film, which is kind of to be expected, I think. Um, because, you know, this one ended more or less on an up note for the good guys, so I think they have to struggle in the next installment. For sure. Do you think there's going to be, like, a time jump? Like, in the classic trilogy, how they went forward, like, three or five years, however many years it was between Hope and Empire – do you think they make a time jump or just pick it up right from, you know, the giant cliffhanger? I kind of hope it picks it right up because I don't I don't want to see Ray and Luke five years from now. I want to know exactly what happened. I mean, ideally, if I could have my way, I would like things to pick up right where the second – right where the first movie – like literally right where the first movie left off. Yeah, and that seems like the smartest move. In worst case scenario, you pick it up right there, do a couple of scenes, and then jump ahead. Yeah, I mean, because don't I mean, don't you want to know what Luke says? Like, right, you know, the first thing that Luke says at that point. Yeah, right after his awesome like hooding thing with his hands. Did you see his mm-hmm. hands go down? He was like interpretive dancing. <laughs> but yeah, I just think, I just want to know like what's going on there. Yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, I'll admit, in the Star Wars craze, um, of course, there were lots of video game sales over the break and all that stuff. Um, I went back to uh, a couple of oldies now at this point, I guess you can call in video game terms. They're very old. Um, The Force Unleashed video games. Okay. I I played those again. Um, I played the first one like a bunch of times when it first came out, and I know it's a pretty polarizing game. In the gaming community, some think it's great, some think it's crap, but I appreciated it. I really liked it. And number two is just super duper weird, and I don't know if I like number two at all, but yeah, it was kind of fun to revisit those weird non-canonical games anymore. So now for somebody, for the people listening who maybe don't know what Force Unleashed is, why don't you just give like just like a you know, two you know, your brief, like, you know, pitch on what it is. Yeah, uh, Force Unleashed is basically um, the God of War franchise, but in Star Wars. Um, (laughs) You are an angry young man by the code name of Starkiller, a.k.a. Luke's originally pitched name uh, in the original script. Uh, So he's code name Starkiller. He's very angry. He's Darth Vader's secret apprentice, and his goal is to hunt down and kill all the Jedi who escaped from Order 66. Um, Of course, you know, as all of these tales go, they have to fit into the canon, at least at that time, not anymore. Uh, He eventually turns good and kind of like brings the Rebel Alliance out of hiding and kickstarts that whole thing. Uh, And then he dies at the end of the first Mm -hmm. one. Spoilers. Uh, And then in number two, are you a clone? Are you not a clone? Um, does your girlfriend still know you're alive, or does she not know? Is Vader kind of incompetent a little bit in the second game? Yeah, all those things. Um, overall, enjoyable experiences. Um, you can skip, you can skip number two. Try number one if you like it, finish it. If you don't, then don't. Um, you can get them super cheap. I got, I think it was only two ninety nine. On Xbox Live, which is why I decided to play them. They were only like three dollars. I was like, yeah, sure, why not? For six bucks, I'll I'll play these again. That Star Destroyer boss fight is so irritating. Yeah, 
Yeah, you have to get in the right spot and then blast all those stupid TIE fighters, and yeah, it's a pain in the butt. It looks so cool in the trailer, but it's so, like, eh, frustrating. I did pick up Star Wars Battlefront, because that was, like, on sale for relatively cheap. Nice, how is it? It's fun. It's like kind of, and you know, we've talked about this on the Mong podcast quite a bit. It's still kind of, it's still bearing the marks of this kind of disturbingly growing trend of like, let's release like a game for sixty dollars as a multiplayer game, and we'll just offer the multiplayer functions, even though there are games like Halo that will give you the multiplayer functions as well as a fully fleshed out campaign for the exact same price. Yeah, boo. Um, so since I do not pay full price, I feel a little bit better about the decision, um, because I mean, it is, uh, you know, at a cheaper price, it is really cool, it does feel really authentic, all the sound effects, music, all the, you know, the visuals look right, and it's fun to, like, murder Darth Vader with Princess Leia. (laughs) That's awesome. Um, but, yeah, like I said, it is, it is definitely lacking a, I think it definitely could have been bolstered by a meaningful single-player campaign. Yeah, I do enjoy my single-player campaigns. Why? Because I freaking suck at online games. I just suck. I I haven't even tried Metal Gear Online, just because I'm pretty sure I would get slaughtered instantaneously at this point, because everyone's been playing it for a month, and, you know, a month is good enough for everyone to reach God tier, because they, I guess... People don't have jobs, or they're just that good at video games. I'm not sure, but I, you have one of you've got one of two of those things going for you. Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> I have lots of free time right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm taking advantage of it on the gaming front, though. Um, mm-hmm. In that time, I have completed Metal Gear Solid Five for the second time. Um, I find it's even better uh, once you go through kind of knowing the twists and turns and. I don't know, just the, the cassette tapes are kind of beautiful, the last ones that you get. I don't know, I just really enjoyed the second time through. Uh, did the Force Unleashed thing, and just this morning, I finally, finally, a game that is eight years old now, uh, beat Dragon Age Origins, <laughs> a game that I have started and stopped many times. Um, not any fault of the games. Uh, I just have a problem with the combat system because I'm not smart enough for that kind of game, I guess. I'm not a very strategic player. I'm kind of more, uh, not so much run and gun, but more like if I can't move out of the way, uh, if I can't like duck and roll and get out of the strike range of, of an enemy, I get really frustrated really quick. Um, but the story started to hook me something fierce at about three quarters of the way through, and I finally beat it this week, just this morning. The Arch Demon fight, I got embarrassingly mad at that fight. Uh, it was such a pain in the ass until uh, I go on the internet, and then they're like, "Um, just shoot the the ballistas at it." And I'm like, "What are you talking about?" Yeah, just shoot those things. It goes into this weird animation, and you can just kind of spam that and win. Oh. Hmm. And then I beat it in, like, ten minutes. <laughs> uh, and it was awesome. I'm excited to play through Awakening uh, and then all the DLC stuff because I had that uh, complete edition pack. And I'm, I'm really stoked to move on to two and then finally play Inquisition, a game I bought day one, thinking that, oh, let's be my inspiration to get through it. Never was. Um, but now I'm finally working my way through this saga. I never beat the first one. I actually beat the other two. Um, the first one kind of frustrated me because it was like a little bit too obtuse in its decision making system. Because it felt like it felt like too many times I was trying to do the right thing and uh, like okay, like specifically like the th- like probably the thing that broke me and just said like because I don't mind like a game that you have to make decisions but you're not quite sure how it's going to turn out. I mean, I can get that can work really well. Um, like, you know, I think the Witcher games do it pretty well, where it's like there's hard decisions to make and you don't quite know what the right thing to do is, but you have to do what you think is best. Um, it felt like, it felt like for Dragon Age, sometimes you would fail to do the right thing, not because, not because you were taking a risk, but more because, like, the game was being obtuse and didn't make it clear enough how to accomplish what you wanted to do. Um, particularly... Wa- particularly for me, like the one that really got me was 
the mission that you had to go to the mage tower. Mm. And I wanted to save the mages, because I didn't want to destroy the mages. But I guess to have been able to save the mages, you had to uh, complete some additional bullshit objective while you're trying to do the boss fights. Which, you know, you're already trying to run around trying to survive, let alone, like, you know, like, that's already difficult enough without trying to figure out what the fucking game wants you to do. <laughs> and so then I wound up, like, screwing over the mages when that was never my intention. And it was like, okay, that's kind of dumb. Like, you know, like, once again, I don't mind the idea of, you know, decision-making being a little bit hazy, and you have to go, like, oh, man, what's, I don't know what's going to happen, what do I do? But when it's just, like, buried behind, like, some kind of, like, requirement that's not very clear in what you're supposed to be doing, that ir- irritates me. Yeah, truth. Um, I guess I stumbled onto that uh, thing with the mages, because, yeah, I thought I was going to have to, like, kill one or the other, like, get rid of the Templars or get rid of the mages, and luckily I did something in my bumble and stumble through the fade and was able to save everybody. Yeah, it's, um, at moments it was very frustrating, and I guess, uh, it's been a while since, uh, because it's one of those games I came back to, would play 20 hours and go away from, play another 20 hours, go away from, so I didn't remember (laughs) a lot of the decisions I made. Um, and then all the epilogue tells me everything that I did and the state of affairs. Apparently, I I royally fucked Orzammar, <laughs> and I have no idea how. I thought I was doing the right thing, and they're like, nope, uh, they rebelled against your choice, and he was a pushover, so he got killed, and yeah. yeah. And the romance system, it's really weird. Uh, mm-hmm. The Bioware always putting romances in their games. Basically, you give them gifts. Then all of a sudden they want to bone you. Mm. All right, cool. I mean, I guess that's like real life. I don't know. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The second one is kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of, I think, probably, I mean, it wasn't a bad game, but it's definitely kind of a letdown. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a lot more limited in scope, and, like, the big thing they really got slammed for is they, they basically, like, built, like, a certain number of environments and just kind of recycled them over and over again, so it kind of felt like you'd, for instance, keep on going to the same warehouse to complete missions. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, a new, completely new band of thugs are in this house, warehouse. Uh-oh, there's a dragon in this warehouse now. <laughs> it's just kind of, uh, space for sale. It's like, what's what's that character in the DC Universe, the broker? He's like, hey, I found you a new hideout. Isn't this the same hideout they just had? Yeah, but hey, whatever. We can refurbish it, you know, color it up a different color. It's cool. Is that the same guy as the calculator? No, no. The calculator and the broker, they're close. They're like bros, but they're not really like – yeah, they're not the same person. They're just kind of bro Calculator gives uh, him leads. Broker says thanks and gives him money. <laughs> Um, Inquisition you'll like a lot. Inquisition was really good. Cool. I'm excited. I'm interested to see how that plays on the last generation, because I hear mixed things. Uh, But we'll find out, because that's what I do. I'm trapped in the last gen, so we'll figure it out. Um, Future, and then future future recommendation for the the inevitable day, like five years from now when you get to Inquisition. (laughs) Um, Biggest pro tip, uh, there is so much more to the game than the hinterlands just remember that <laughs> okay because <laughs> the hinterlands seem huge and you're like wow this is like probably a big portion of the game and it's like nope there's like this huge map full of other stuff you can be doing oh wow yay open world games Woo! <laughs> see that's, that's the benefit that's the benefit of having lots of free time is that open world games aren't so daunting anymore because when you have to work you know like eight nine hours a day you come home and you go I can play this for a couple of hours of a hundred and like twenty. Yay! This will take me six months. <laughs> yeah, open world games. So stepping back for a little bit, I will admit with the whole Metal Gear Solid Five, it has kind of like it has actually kind of stuck with me. It's one of the games from last year that has kind of stuck with me, and I think I'll probably want to play it again at some point. Um, particularly, you know. Of course, Until Dawn, and then that, and like Witcher 3, I think, are the games I still kind of find myself thinking about from time to time. Yeah, I'm really excited. Uh, A a next-gen console will happen sooner than later. I'm waiting for a price drop, and I hear there's rumors of one in the spring. So Mm -hmm. that is probably when Chaz will officially join the current generation. (laughs) 
Also, like, really weird opinion. I, um... So, as we know, like, Metal Gear Solid V's kind of unofficial theme song is Man Who Sold the World. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was actually a cover of the David Bowie version. Yeah, yes, it um, was. And I know a lot of people lost their minds, like, why didn't they get, like, David Bowie's version of this? This is stupid. Can I... I, and the weird thing is, like, the opinion I formulated, especially because now everybody, you know, everybody's talking about Bowie. Bowie just died. Um, mm-hmm. I just got, I watched Saturday Night Live last night, and they actually showed a clip of him singing Man Who Sold the World. And part of me almost thinks it was a, it was a intentional choice, because I think that, you know, no doubt David Bowie is a fantastic musician, and his, you know, his songs are money. I actually kind of think that the cover version of the song works better for the game. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I love uh, Bowie's version, of course, Rest in Power, all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but man, like, the the weird synthesized thing, it just <laughs> it fit with that overall um, 80s theme that right. I think they were going for. Uh, and, you know, it could have been a circumstance of, well, we can't afford David Bowie's version. It might have been, um, but... But, yeah, I kind of like to think it was an intentional choice because it sounds... So 80s, so mm-hmm. 80s, and the um, original is a 70s rock tune, and it sounds like right. a 70s rock tune. Nothing wrong with that, but yeah, I think the choice is great. I love that. The, song. the first one, like, yeah, the Bowie version is a lot more kind of glammy and flourishy, while it kind of feels that the 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 cover version is a lot more stripped down. And like a little more stripped down and threadbare, which I think for the purposes of this particular game at that particular moment, I think there was something about it that was just kind of a little like ominous and other kind of a little kind of it kind of was kind of foretelling the events to come. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And man, I will say this for Metal Gear Solid Five: it's probably got it has to have maybe the greatest opening chapter I've ever played in a game, or definitely one of. I mean, that whole hospital sequence is just like A+. plus. Yeah, fire whale. <laughs> it's just like you have no idea what's going on, but the stakes are huge, and yeah, it's just awesome. Yeah, there's a guy on fire trying to chase you, little baby mantis, fire whales, flying fire trucks, uh, a tank. And like a real feeling of helplessness for most of it, because here you are like in a, you know, hospital gown. Most of the time you don't have a weapon. Mm-hmm. And I, I like my heart races uh, every time I played it, and because they make you replay that sequence uh, as the final chapter as well, it, it was I've played that sequence four times, and mm-hmm. and all four times there's like a certain moment where it's like that play dead moment. Mm-hmm. There's like the silly is he peeing himself moment, but then right after that I'm like, shit, what would I do in that situation? I would be losing my mind. <laughs> I would, I'd be dead. <laughs> like plain and simple. But yeah, it's just uh, that's a great that's a great sequence. Very, very Metal Gear for lack of a better <laughs> term. <laughs> yeah, so that was a fun way to to kick off my my uh, sabbatical from work. Yeah, pretty crazy stuff. How about you? You've been uh, catching up on lots of stuff not covered in uh, the Mong podcast. Make sure to listen. I think it drops every Wednesday. Uh, Yeah, like I said, uh, basically I've cleared most of my gaming card. I finally beat Fallout 4. I finally beat Rise of the Tomb Raider, so those are officially off uh, off my pile. Um, I've been kind of playing kind of... In some of my free time, I've been kind of playing back through the Danganronpa series simply because it's been, you know, I've been a couple of years since I've played it and um, enjoying enjoying that kind of interest. It's interesting playing playing those games again with a kind of a veteran's eye, kind of knowing, you know, generally kind of what mostly happens. Um, it's kind of fun to play that again. And uh, last night I decided to subject myself to I uh, subject myself to further torture. I picked up the game Bloodborne for a second time. Oh boy. <laughs> um I got it right when it first came out and I played it for a while and it was really hard. It was a combination of like it's a hard game and also it was like right before 
uh, right before WrestleMania, and so I wound up not playing it for a while, so I went on like a trip and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then I just kind of moved on. And so it's just kind of like I'm I'm kind of torturing myself as I want to. Like, I don't think to be, like, a legit gamer, you need to be able to play and beat hard games, but I kind of want to see if I can do it. No no, no shame in that. I understand that. That, that sounds like torture to me, but um, I will support you. <laughs> I've already made pretty decent progress in a single night. Um, I mean, it's it's hard. There's no doubt about it. It's hard, but... Um, but it's kind of, you kind of get into the satisfying loop, because luckily, at least where I'm at so far, even if you die, you know, you don't really lose that much. You know, you just kind of pick it up and try again. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, I so, I don't know if I have the patience for that. I mean, I got so mad at the freaking Archdemon, which everyone says is the easiest boss fight in the game, until I figured out the loophole. I, I don't think I could put myself through a Bloodborne or... <laughs> Well, part of what's driving me is that I really I don't know how much you've seen of Bloodborne, but I think the design is absolutely stellar. It's like this beautiful game and it's like this really kind of creepy world. Um and I think that's probably what draws me to it. I mean, like I don't know if I'd feel the same the same draw to like a like Dark Souls or something like that. Um but it's specifically like the world that they created for Bloodborne so kind of interesting and kind of cool looking. That I think that's my incentive to try to play it is that I want to I like I like the world so much that I kind of want to play I want to be able to experience it and if that means I have to gut my way through it that's what I'll have to do. Cool. Yeah, I get that. That was kind of my uh, thing with Dragon Age too. Just because I didn't like the mechanics, I uh, Bioware always gets me with their worlds. Uh, so that's kind of what kept me going on that. But yeah, well I give you all of my support <laughs> as best I can for your trek into Bloodborne. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. That's big. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I will continue to update you as this prog- as progress is made. Awesome. Awesome. I've actually... Um, you mentioned you wanted to do... Or that you're actually... You're doing uh, Danganronpa again. I have been on a major... Like, I've had an itch because I usually play it once a year... Um, mm-hmm. But I haven't played it since being here in the city about a year and a half now, and uh, and I didn't even yeah it's about been about two years since I played through a full Mass Effect playthrough, mm-hmm. and uh, that was another catalyst to the Dragon Age completion was no dude you can't start this this saga until you beat. Like at least the first game, <laughs> beat at least the first game of Dragon Age before you go on another 140 hour uh, journey through something you know already. Yeah, you're going to start sometime though, because I mean, Andromeda is coming out. I think December. Oh boy! Yay! 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 Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't think they've officially announced a release date yet, but I think December is generally when it's expected to hit. Very cool. Very cool. And yeah, this this is the year. This is the year where I join. I join the rest of the gaming community. Now, have you made any kind of decision on which console you're going for? Uh, at the moment, I'm leaning towards PlayStation. Um, however, there is that whole backwards compatibility thing that Xbox has started to get itself. You know, going for itself. Um, uh, the library is pretty small right now, but they keep releasing new games like basically every other week, from what I understand. So I don't know. There's a contemplation of an Xbox One, but mainly because uh, a lot of people that I know have a PlayStation. I'm going. All right, maybe PlayStation just in case I want to do an online component. I might have someone to do it with. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of torn. <laughs> um, yeah, I've actually tried the backwards compatibility. It actually works great um, because I started it and got a little sidetracked, but I'll definitely get back to it. Is I finally bought Gears of War three because I never beat that one or I never played that one. Period. So now I for like two bucks I now own Gears of War three. Nice. Um, <clears throat> well, beyond the online component, I mean, I think the large thing you have to look at, Chaz, it's a kind of Take a look at the exclusives for each system and figure out what what 
do you want to play more? I mean, if you go if you go Xbox, obviously like the big ones are going to be um you could play Halo 5. Mm-hmm. Um if you have uh, you know, it, another exclusive is Sunset Overdrive. I don't know if you know anything about that game. Not, Came out a while ago. Not really. I've heard of it, but I don't really know much about it. It's fun. Um Quantum Break comes out this year from the guys who did Alan Wake and Max Payne. That looks kind of cool. Nice, nice. And then um, PlayStation, though, has got that Nathan Drake. Yes, it does. It's got, uh, uh, It's got. yeah, of course, it's got Uncharted. Um, of course, going back in time a little bit, it's got um, Infamous Second Son, which you haven't played. Mm, I do like those games. Um, and on top of that, I mean, it's got, uh, God, I always screw his name up. Is it Horizon Zero Dawn's coming out for that? Is that the one with the crazy mechanical monster beast thing? Yeah, hunting the, hunting the robot dinosaur, the, the robot monsters. Yep. Sweet. Oh, Cause man. that game does look pretty slick. Yeah, some hard choices. Some hard choice will be made, uh, initially. The ultimate goal, of course, is to get where, uh, Every gamer wants to get uh, and have one of each, but realistically, we got to pick one to start. Because I'll admit, uh, X360 made it easy when I first bought the 360. It had Bioshock was a exclusive at the time, Mass mm-hmm. Effect was an exclusive at the time, uh, the Gears of War was an exclusive at the time. So it had a lot of reasons for me to go 360 to start, and then it was Metal Gear Solid 4 that got me to go PlayStation as well. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the choice is. I'll keep you tuned. I'll keep you keep you up to date. And if you, you know, if uh, if any listeners out there have a recommendation, you can uh look us up on the social media, Facebook, we are the Friendly Neighborhood Fanboys, Twitter, we are FN Fanboys, uh or you can email us at fnfanboys@gmail.com at if you have a recommendation on what Chaz should get. Xbox One or PlayStation 4 to start come this spring or whenever the prices drop. Uh, yeah, shoot us a line. Do that. <laughs> you know what's like a it was like a really big video gaming derp for me was that okay at E3 like zero like you know uh, Horizon Zero Dawn was announced and everybody's like awesome it's like robot cavemen with robots and this is amazing it's and that was great but then it's like Ubisoft follow up of like guess what, guys, we're going to make a new Far Cry, and it's going to be cavemen. And it's like, but we've got robot cavemen already. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) Poor Far Cry. Far Cry Primal. Far Cry Primal, okay. I still haven't played Blood Dragon. I have that, but I still haven't played it. Yeah, maybe I'll do that between Dragon Age games. (laughs) Far, Far Cry 4 is worth a check out. That was like the first Far Cry game I ever actually played. A lot of fun? You know, it was. It was just like so like absurd and over the top. And and especially that kind of drove home when I was just kind of casually playing it. And my buddy Ian came over. Um, and he was just kind of sat down and watched me play it. And the amount he flipped out when like a bear tried to attack me. And I shot the bear with like a rocket launcher and it flew over a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> uh, have you played any of the Far Cry games? Uh, I played. What was the? Was it Far Cry Two? That was in Africa. I think that might have been three. Okay, it was probably three. Uh, that's the one that I played a little bit of. Uh, and mm-hmm. then I got gaming ADD, and something else came along, and yeah, it was one of those games that I bought on some sort of crazy sale. It was like twenty eight bucks or something. And then I just was like, okay, cool, I have this for whenever I want to play it. And then I tried to play it, and it was like, this is really fun. And then something else, something more important came out. Yeah, like, like I said, I liked Far Cry 4. It was a lot of fun and just kind of like bizarre and over the top because it's kind of open world with lots of guns. Sweet. Open worlds, man. Open worlds. Mm-hmm. All righty. So I'd like to cover a little bit of news. Okay. All right. So... Um, New Suicide Squad trailer this Tuesday. Really? Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm down to see more. I'm down to, uh, down to see some more of that uh, Joker Low. Yeah, yeah, the ju- Juggalo Joker. How do magnets work? This guy has no <laughs> idea. Miracles. 
Um, yeah, that's dropping on Tuesday as part of um, the big kind of – the shows are coming back. So The Flash is coming back on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Arrow is coming back on Wednesday. And, of course, uh, the one I'm super excited for, The Legends of Tomorrow, uh, starts on Thursday. But to kick off the whole thing, uh, CW is doing a neat thing, kind of a throwback, really, considering uh, the power of the Internet these days. It's a half-an-hour television special that talks about the uh, – like I think it's called the dawn of the DC movie universe or something along those lines. Uh, hosted by Kevin Smith and Zack Snyder, and they'll be talking about all the new movies coming out. Mm -hmm. And that is when the Suicide Squad trailer will drop. Um, I'm excited to see this, mainly because they haven't done, like, big featurette specials in a while. I feel like it's an antiquated notion, and I kind of wanted to make a comeback. I remember those were really fun when you'd watch them just randomly in the afternoon, like, this movie's coming out! Look at this! I kind of miss those. You have any thoughts? Um, I'm excited to. I'm excited for next week because I'm now actually gasp caught up on Flash, so I will actually be watching, you know, Flash and Heroes of Tomorrow as they come out. Nice. Um, and so I, I'm really excited to see where things go. Because like I said, Flash has been pretty phenomenal. Like it went from something that I was unsure about after watching an episode or two to something that, you know, I've like wholeheartedly endorse. Yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty great show. I I really, really like it. And that was uh I think it was a good cliffhanger to leave the mid season cliffhanger. <laughs> um Yeah. I'm excited to see what happens next. There's lots of questions. Lots and lots of questions. Um I'm worried because like my T V schedule's going from nothing to getting really full really quick. Um because, you know, that – so that's two shows there I'm going to start watching. And then a week from today, The X-Files comes back. Oh, wow. And that's kind of huge. I mean, it's like – luckily it's a short season. It's like, I think, six episodes. All right. Uh, they're kind of doing that – that kind of new limited run thing that's all the rage now. I think partially to probably hopefully prove to somebody that this The X-Files could be viable again. Um, and so that goes, and then jump forward to next month, um, of course, Walking Dead comes back for the second half of its season, mm-hmm. and uh, Better Call Saul starts up for its second season, Woohoo! which I'm incredibly excited about. Yeah, lots lots of shows coming back. Agent Carter starts up next week, the same day as The Flash, jerks, but mm-hmm. I'll be watching both of those. <laughs> Uh, next month we get like have you seen that uh, have you seen that FXX or FX I think it's FX um, is doing a OJ Simpson TV series about the OJ Simpson trial. <laughs> what is it? Uh, the sequel to Making a Murderer on Netflix. Uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. is playing OJ Simpson. Oh wow. <laughs> okay, sure. And it also features like David Schwimmer and like John Travolta among other people. <laughs> Okay. All right. Sure. Why not? I I, just, I kind of just have to witness it. I, I'm not sure what to expect, but um, as um, the bad guy from – or many people from Mad Max said, witness me. Yeah. Witness. Witness me. Hopefully I don't come back and go, mediocre. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe maybe he'll say something else. <laughs> Coming back from an O.J. Simpson TV show. I mean, it could be good. Cuba Gooding Jr. doesn't get the credit he, he's uh, he's due sometimes. I think he's he's pretty good. He's pretty good. Well, have you ever, dude? Have you ever seen Boys in the Hood? Absolutely, yeah. Boys in the Hood. That movie's fantastic. Like that movie was so good. I was like, like moved to tears by the end of that movie. Yeah, but dude, I don't know. Have you seen Pearl Harbor? Huh. <laughs> I heard he was awesome in it. Yeah, Apparently. he's great in it, but the movie is not good. No, no, it's no. it's pretty, it's pretty bad as a whole. Uh, there are some moments of good, but no, it's 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 pretty brutal. Uh, snow dogs, snow dogs, yeah, snow dogs. Woo! Or um, what's it called? Uh, boat trip. Yeah, <laughs> it's like he he did Jerry Maguire and got his Oscar, and then it just kind of brief, it kind of spiked downwards. Yeah, poor guy. The Oscar. It could be the death knell. 
but it could also lead you to glory, as I'm hoping uh, Sylvester Stallone gets an... Oh, yeah, so you saw that Creed was so good, right? Oh, my goodness, it was so good. Uh, is it bad that I got super teary-eyed at the end? No, nah, like, when they were climbing up the stairs at the end of the film, I was kind of, I was tearing up. It's true. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, because that was just awesome. Like, Sylvester Stallone was kind of good. I'm actually... I'm actually probably kind of a little bit bothered that only Sylvester Stallone got nominated. Yeah, over uh, over Michael B. Jordan. That kind of bugs me a bit, too. Because he was really good. Yeah, I was sad to see him snuffed uh, in the actor category because just, just nominate the kid at least. you know, Even if you don't give it to him, I mean, come on. That's a performance that should be noted because, yeah, put him in all the things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was kind of it was kind of conspicuous because I I don't know if you've read that but there's been some diversity some shots about diversity fired at the academy after like the nominations were released and you know it's it's hard because you know you don't know exactly what goes into what's picked but I mean it is conspicuous that straight out of Compton kind of got more or less snubbed yeah completely and Creed pretty much got snubbed except oh let's give like you know the white guy you know Sylvester Stallone you get the nod. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a little dubious at times. I don't know how those things work. Right. I mean, I can't claim that I'm an expert and I'm not going to I'm not going to jump you know, I'm not going to jump too far into the debate about diversity just because I don't feel I'm too qualified to speak about it, but I could, I could see that as being kind of conspicuous that you know, out of out of a film that had both a black director and a black lead that you know, like the one thing they pull out of it is like let's give like the white supporting actor some love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, it would be a, a neat story for him to, you know, get the nod for Rocky, you know, the movie that basically kick-started his career. But, yeah, there could have been other things out of that movie. That Though, I mean, he's deserving, don't get me wrong, but like I said, he was, like, you know, his that was probably, other than, like, the first Rocky, that was probably his probably best performance I think I've ever seen out of him. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, the the guy, like, the first Rocky movie, I just remember watching that and going, this is the same guy that did Rambo 3, <laughs> the one in Afghanistan? My goodness, because I, I saw that one, of course, before I saw the original Rocky, uh, and this was, you know, many years ago, but, I mean, uh, he's, it was... he's better than he gives himself credit for, even. Mm-hmm. Um, and like as a fan of the Rocky series, there's plenty there to enjoy, and it, you know it definitely was kind of heartbreaking. But it was definitely heartbreaking in Rocky Balboa to see, you know, Adrian's tombstone, and it was a little bit more heartbreaking to see now Polly's tombstone sitting along beside it with like Rocky still alive. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty harsh. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I did. Like I said, I did enjoy Creed quite a bit. I think I. Th- I think I it came like I put out a little list of my favorite films. I think it came in at number two. Um, I think it went like Mad Max. It went Mad Max, um, Creed, Star Wars. I think Kingsman and then The Martian. Was the Kingsman this uh, this last year? Really? Yes, it was. Yep. Wow. Like in January. Man, for some reason I thought it was winter of 2014, but. I guess I'm mistaken, because, yeah, I remember uh, I, that was the first movie that I saw in the theaters here in New York City. And it stuck with, like, you know, I, after a pretty long year, it stuck, you know, it says something that really stuck with me. I thought it was really something quite special and a lot of fun. Do we know if that one's getting a sequel? Um, I think it is. Um, I can't say that I have a confirmed source, but I could swear I've read that it is. Sweet. I mean, it wouldn't shock me. It was, like, well-received. I think it did pretty well at box office. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, I'm excited to see uh, what comes of that, because, man, Colin Firth from that movie. I like that. <laughs> I was kind of shocked on the Oscar front that Wiz Khalifa got snubbed for um, his song from Furious 7. Yeah? Because it seemed like it, because it seemed like such an obvious shoe-in, because I don't know, you know, because you know the song I'm talking about, See You Again? Yeah, yeah. Which is basically like one big tribute to Paul Walker, mm-hmm. 
So it just kind of seemed like that was like a shoe. And I was like telling uh, my brother and my sister-in-law, I was like, well, you know, if the Oscars had any sense, that song should be nominated. And of course, what they, should they do? They should have them perform that song during the like, end memoriam section of the night. Oh yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, how like that's like basic, that's basic show programming right there. That that needs to happen. And then I was like, but yet, you know, didn't get nominated somehow. Weird. Uh, Writing on the wall picked up. Uh, the Golden Globe for best songs so that probably puts it as like the favorite to win the Oscar at this point. You mean that weird pussy song? It's a weird James Bond song. It doesn't make me feel manly. Oh, shut up, Internet. That's a great song. I love that song. I'm happy that. Yeah, I think I think uh, I think writing uh, writing on the wall is a far better song than people. Have, a lot of people gave it credit for, and I think Sam Smith has got a pretty incredible voice. Yeah, yeah. I watched that movie again uh, on New Year's Eve. We went up to Connecticut and stayed with some friends that got it from their mm-hmm. Croatian cousins. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I, that that song. I really like that song because it's got that that riff that goes on throughout the whole movie. It's yeah, it's a great song. I'm happy to. See I think it. it's an incredibly appropriate song for the overall kind of feeling and theme of Spectre. Agreed. Agreed. So back to the Flash just a little bit. I don't know if you okay, heard. Jump back. Okay. Okay. Um, He's made himself a very, very prevalent fan of the show, uh, and that's our boy Kevin Smith. Uh, mm-hmm. And he will be directing an episode of this season of The Flash. Love that. Yeah, so I'm interested to see uh, how that goes. It's probably going to uh, be pretty good. I mean, he's a pretty decent director, so it'll be uh, it'll be fun to see. I'm excited to see if he brings anything uh, new and different to the table because of his uh, usual style choices. And yeah, I'm excited for him. That sounds awesome. With 100% more dick and fart jokes. Absolutely. Hell yeah. And snooch to the nooches and all that good stuff. It's going to introduce like a new set of villains that basically hang out in front of the coffee shop trying to sell weed. I would kind of love to see Kevin Smith pen a um, rogues in the diner script. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, what do they talk about when the Flash is not <laughs> foiling their plans? And then the Flash, could, of course, can come in, and then, you know, he could have some fun, witty dialogue. I'd like to see that episode. That'd be great. But we'll see. <laughs> I'm interested to see with Heroes of Tomorrow exactly – you know, the, the biggest thing that I'm kind of curious about about Heroes of Tomorrow is the inclusion of Killer Frost uh, – Kill- uh, Captain Cold on the team because obviously this is a superhero team or a team of good guys and Captain Cold's on the team so I'm kind of interested to see how that is played slash explained yeah it's going to be interesting and I, I mean I, I really like uh, what's his name uh, what is that actor's name who played yeah, Captain don't... Cold yeah that guy I like that guy <laughs> uh, yeah it'll be interesting to see I'm super excited for Rip Hunter Time Master mm-hmm. That excites me uh, to no end because what a weird and obscure DC reference that is. And their their ship is called the uh, the Wave Rider, and I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> That's the name of like a cheesy '90s super colorful um, time traveling bad guy. So uh, it's like the, the nerdiest shows on TV currently right now, and mm-hmm. very exciting. <sighs> Let's see. Anything else going on in the world we want to talk about? The world of mm, We could probably close out with a little bit of talk about the Rumble coming up in a week. Oh, yeah, we are. We are one week away from the Royal Rumble event. That'll be fun. I always like the Royal Rumble, even when it turns into a giant train wreck like last year's. Adam, mm-hmm. uh, how about you let our uh, listeners know what the Rumble is? So, Royal Rumble is... Um, basically, the Royal Rumble is an annual is an annual WWE pay per view. It's one of the four bigs, um, along with WrestleMania, SummerSlam, and Survivor Series. Royal Rumble is a big deal because it marks kind of like the beginning of WrestleMania season, which WrestleMania, of course, is like the biggest event that the WWE has. It's kind of their Super Bowl, and the general reason it's considered kind of like the beginning of the road to WrestleMania is because of its main event, which is called the Royal Rumble. Royal Rumble is a match in which 30 people battle each other in an over-the-top battle royal with the person, last person standing, winning a title shot at WrestleMania. Yeah, and this year there's a mm-hmm. uh, a wrench thrown in the mix. Uh, this year's Royal Rumble will actually be for the championship. 
uh, for the WWE title. So it's going to be a little bit, uh, a little bit more intrigue. There's always intrigue as who's going to face the champion, but now it's this year who is the champion, and then there's an even bigger question of who will face that champion. So the Royal Rumble this year is uh, particularly exciting. Yes, for the second time ever has the title been on the line in a a Royal Rumble. Yeah, the first one was 1992, where Ric Mm -hmm. Flair walked out with the title, (laughs) which was a surprise to a lot of people back then. So are you excited for this? How are you feeling about this? Um, I'm excited because I feel that uh, WWE is in an interesting place with all of the injuries that have plagued their roster. Uh, recently, with uh, Seth Rollins, of course, blowing out his knee in October, uh, John Cena coming back and then doing something to his shoulder, and he's gone now for a few months. Cesaro is gone. Uh, Rusev is gone. A bunch of the, their big players are basically gone. Orton. Yeah, Orton is uh, is not there right now uh, because he's rehabbing an injury. Uh, they're kind of just plagued with injuries. It's an injury-heavy uh, season for the E right now, uh, and I'm interested to see how this goes because if they're smart, which I know sometimes seems like an oxymoron to say WWE and smart in the same sentence lately because of their writing, um, they have a chance to make some really key players out of who's left um, because admittedly I feel like the undercard gets snubbed a lot in terms of creative, and now they have no choice. Um, they're kind of left with, well, we got to do something big with who we have because we got to sell network subscriptions and WrestleMania tickets because we got 110,000 seats to fill uh, at that event. So we got to make the best of what we have. And I'm not sure that if John Cena didn't get injured, if WWE would have made this match for the title. I don't know for sure. Um, but I'm I'm excited to see what comes of it because, yeah, like you said, this is only the second time that this will ever happen in the history of the company, the Rumble deciding the champion. And then we got a couple months of intrigue because who's going to face that champion and how? How are they going to get there? Um, I'm actually excited to see what they do with what they have going into the WrestleMania season. How about you? Um, I want to be excited, but I kind of keep getting the sinking feeling they're going to do something really obvious. Um, absolute worst case scenario for me is I've got this, like, I've got this kind of inset, this kind of inset intuition that Triple H is going to enter the Rumble and win. Ew. And then they're going to do Reigns versus Triple H. And I don't, I don't want to see Triple H anywhere near the title, to be honest. And I, but I'm, I'm afraid that's what they're going to do. Mm. It's simple, and I guess from a storyline perspective, it makes sense. But yeah, no, it, it they have an opportunity to do something with somebody, and I don't. H is not the guy. Like he's been there before. He doesn't need to be there again. And I understand Roman Reigns is their experiment. But they should be focusing on the currently full-time active roster. Uh, as much as Triple H has to do with the company, uh, he's a part-time in-ring competitor, and they should be focusing on the full-time in-ring guys. So that, as much as that sadly makes sense from a storyline perspective, I yeah, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. Um, you know, I also don't want to see. You know, I really don't want to see Roman retain. I don't want to see. Seamus, keep it. I don't want to see Roman win, mainly because I don't want to see Roman win two Royal Rumbles in a row. That doesn't interest me. Um, like I said, I have no interest in seeing Seamus win, because, uh, um I don't know who who should step in and win it at this point. Uh, I mean, do you have, like, do you have your eye on somebody? You're like, yes, that's what you should do, WWE. Um, there's a part of me that likes the idea. Uh, it's kind of predictable of a Brock Lesnar win. Because uh, this past week he entered himself into the match. Uh, Because then you can do Roman versus Lesnar 2 at the Fastlane pay-per-view. 
um, mm-hmm. which is usually just a throwaway show. So if you get that match on it, it's no longer a throwaway show because this time, you know, and, and make it some sort of stipulation like one fall to a finish, we will have a winner because mm-hmm. the last time they wrestled, we didn't really get a winner between the two. Right. Of them. So that could be a big money match. And then Mania, you just, I don't know, you do something other. I mean, you can, sure, I guess, if you want, you could have Triple H challenge Roman, but just have Roman wipe the freaking floor with him because. Mm-hmm. Like, who cares <laughs> at that point? But I know that's not how it'll go because, um, you know, there's a part of me that's holding out hope, uh, maybe maybe too much hope that Daniel Bryan is cleared and mm-hmm. they just haven't let it out to the public. Um, but that's probably not going to happen. Here's kind of like – here's the kind of the scenario that I came up with, and I, I know some people might groan about this, but I agree that we need to be focusing on the new talent, but I also see the opportunity for an ending as well. I think it would be really cool if Lesnar comes out, Lesnar wrecks shop, just like throwing out people left and right, and the announcers are going, you know, Brock Lesnar's a monster. Um, I don't think there's anybody that's going to you know, be able to stop Lesnar at this point. Boom. Bell tolls. Lights out. Taker wins the Rumble. Mm. Taker goes into Mania, his last Mania as champion. Oh wow, that could be that could be pretty big. I don't know who you'd put him up against, but I don't really want to see him against Lesnar again. But if it was for the purpose of retiring him, I wouldn't have an issue with putting on the uh, putting the belt on Undertaker for a couple of months, just as like a one last goodbye kind of victory lap. That would be pretty cool. Uh, I, I, from what I understand, and of course this is all rumor, uh, the original idea was Cena versus Taker. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was that's what I understood. Now that's obviously kind of in the wind. Yeah, that's completely off the table. And Rollins, sadly, isn't coming back uh, from mm-hmm. reports. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I really hope it's not your <laughs> initial prediction of uh, Triple H winning, but... Oh, boy. Then we'd be subjected to, like, several months of Triple H crowing about how he's the champion and it was best for business. And Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm interested to see, though, if that happens, I fully anticipate another uh, crowd reaction like last year mm-hmm. where it's just dead silent after the match. That is the scariest reaction I've ever seen. Uh, listeners, go to YouTube, type in Royal Rumble, 2015 finish or ending and uh, just listen to the crowd reaction because it is scary uh, to the point of like, yeah, okay, none none of these people care. Because if they were booing, all right, that's one thing. If they're cheering, that's another. But if they are dead silent, you did something wrong. And I was like, ew, that's the worst reaction I've ever heard in my life. That was scary. Yeah, not even The Rock could salvage salvage that moment. Yeah, no. Ew. Ew. <laughs> so, do you think there's going to be any true surprises in the Rumble? Uh, I'm. I have my fingers crossed for AJ Styles. <laughs> uh, is it going to happen? Probably not. Uh, but I've got my fingers crossed for it because I think that would be really, really cool. Uh, and I think he's. I think he's a well enough a known like known name uh, to just debut as AJ Styles in the match mm-hmm. of this caliber uh, in front of the crowd. Because I think that for like a pay-per-view crowd, I think enough um, quote-unquote smart wrestling fans um, go to the pay-per-views. So I think enough would know who AJ is to get him over in his initial appearance. But it probably won't happen. Do you think we're going to see any NXTers in the Rumble? I would definitely not rule that out. I think it would be a great way to um, show off some acts. Like, even if they don't win, I mean, you know, put Joe in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, just for, just for uh, the smart fans, the quote-unquote smart fans. Just, you know, have Lesnar be in the ring, and then Samoa Joe's music hits. Why? Because that's a novelty. And even if that's the only thing we ever see from those two, it will have happened for a couple of minutes. That, mm-hmm. I think that's a cool idea. Um, throw in, uh, you know, maybe, maybe throw in uh, Jordan Gable just for the hell of it. You know, why not? <laughs> I think that probably if anybody's a candidate, it's probably going to be um, probably either Joe Zane, Sami Zayn, or probably Baylor. 
Oh, yeah. Especially if Owens is in it. Because uh, mm-hmm. then you can have Sami Zayn come out and at least get a measure of revenge on Owens before the big uh, WrestleMania weekend NXT event. Oh, wouldn't that be cool if they actually build, like, for Mania, they actually built towards a Zayn versus Owens actual WrestleMania match? That would be fantastic, and it would make sense, and it'd be easy to write, uh, <laughs> and it would be awesome, so I'm sad. <laughs> All those things make me say they won't do it, but yes. <laughs> because those two would absolutely like, blow the lid off of WrestleMania. Yeah, absolutely. They've they uh, They've got chemistry, for sure. I mean, they, you know, they grew up together on the wrestling scene. Right. Um, yeah, so yeah, put those in put those two in front of 90,000, 100,000 people. Yeah, that'd be they tear it up. So WWE prove us wrong, you know, give us something we're not expecting on Sunday, you know, a week from today, huh? Yeah, yeah, do that. And of course, we'll be talking about it, I'm sure, in our next episode. Anything we want to touch <laughs> on uh before we get out of here with our kind of welcome back episode? <laughs> I think we did pretty good. That was well over an hour. All right. Awesome. Awesome. So you can, of course, subscribe uh, via the Mong, the Middle of Nowhere Gaming podcast. Uh, go to Twitter and follow us at FN Fanboys, Facebook.com at Friendly Neighborhood Fanboys. Email us. You got some topics. You got some things you want us to talk about. FN Fanboys at gmail.com. Uh, of course, middleofnowheregaming.com, bookmark it. Uh, you can follow them on Twitter, mong.com, YouTube at the Mong Network, or Middle of Nowhere Gaming Plays. And you can also find them on Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. And we will be back with a more consistent 2016 schedule. Maybe we'll even get this thing live at some point. I'm not sure. That would be amazing. That'd be- Make that happen, Jazz. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll figure out how cool. that works. Or maybe I need to make it happen. Maybe we both just need to make it happen. Like, let's not put the burden on any one of us. Yeah, we'll figure it out. <laughs> yes. We will reach out and put out the feelers. If you want us to be live, you know, send us a, send us an email, fnfanboys at gmail.com. You want us live? Let's hear it. Let's do it. Or send us a plane ticket. That would also really help. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Plane ticket. That'd be sweet. <laughs> yeah. I think they run uh, about 300 bucks. Not too bad. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, support uh, Mong on uh, – what's that? That, that – uh, Patreon. Patreon, that's the thing, yeah. So maybe we, you know, just send $300 with a memo of Adam plane ticket. Uh Yes. (laughs) All righty. And hopefully we'll be back next week. We will be back next week. No hopefully about it. We'll be back next week. We'll make it work. Yeah, we'll make it work. For Adam Leonard, I am Chaz King. This has been your friendly neighborhood fanboys. Happy 2016, y'all. We back. Woo.